I V M. Hi, we're Team Splainer. Welcome to an all new episode of Press Decode, a weekly podcast where we take Splainer's mission to declutter the news one step further. Check out our newsletter for more stories and follow us at Splainer Inn to keep up with all the fun things we plan for our Splainer fam. So sit back, relax, and don't let the news give you the blues. I'm Vagda, your host for the day. And today we have both Sarah and Prafula to pump up the grumps. Like always, we have three segments for you. In our big story, we will try to wrap our heads around the army operation that went horribly wrong in Nagaland. In our food for thought section, we're going in a very different direction to see if fitness and body positivity have anything in common. Finally, we'll be roasting and toasting our fave and least fave items. All right, so let's begin with our big story. This past weekend, a special unit of the army was on an operation to target Naga insurgents. According to the intelligence received by the army, they were looking for a bolero, which is a type of a car, and then found a local group of men who were returning from the mines also coming in a similar car. The troops opened fire and killed six of the occupants on the spot. Two were injured and then were taken to the hospital. Soon after, villagers arrived at the scene and clashed with the soldiers, who again opened fire. Another seven civilians and a soldier were killed. This in turn triggered an angry mob, which attacked and vandalized the Assam Rifles District headquarters. Two more villagers were killed in that confrontation. The operation has since been registered as a case of murder and attempt to murder. The FIR says it is obvious, and I'm quoting, it is obvious that the intention of security forces is to murder and injure civilians. Meanwhile, the army has kicked off its own internal investigation into the operation. By Wednesday, different versions of the operation emerged. News 18 had a story that implies that the villagers were involved in protecting the insurgents who were tipped off and then put civilians into the vehicle instead. A survivor of the attack who is recovering in the hospital told Indian Express that they were not signaled to stop at all. He said that they killed us directly. We were not trying to flee. We were just in the vehicle. This directly contradicts the Home Minister's claim in the Parliament that they were killed while trying to flee. Also, a Naga police report points to the fact that army commandos tried to hide the six bodies by wrapping and loading them up in a pickup truck, apparently with the intention of taking them to their base camp. On the other side, the state cabinet has passed a resolution formally asking the union government to repeal the AFSPA, which is the Armed Forces Special Powers Act, and the ongoing Hornbill Festival has been cancelled. So that's all about what's happened. Can we get a little into the why and the fallout and implications of this? But before that, can we just get a little more context about the conflict? Prafula? Right. So... um... It's no surprise that conflicts in the northeastern states are tricky business. This is largely, you know, because violence that we see today is a result of the years of unresolved internal and external tensions in the states, as well as contentions between the people and every central government that has ever been. Because um, the ethnic tensions, for example, stem from, number one, the fact that the state of Nagaland borders Myanmar. Uh, And this is worth noting only because the Naga people have historically lived in the Naga Hills, as well as in Manipur and Myanmar. Uh, And second, the Naga feel alienated by the mainland, and I don't want to speak for them, of course, but you see this discourse online a lot. Uh, When the British left, Nagaland declared itself an autonomous state independent of India. However, uh, the state was then forcefully integrated into the country. A referendum in 1951 actually showed that 99.9% of Naga people actually supported a sovereign Nagaland. Uh, Yeah, and... Nine years later, a 16-point agreement with clauses that were contested by both Naga leaders and the center followed, which then led to the creation of Nagaland state as we know it in 1963. Uh, The Naga struggle has uh, been peaceful largely, however, uh, up until the early 50s. You know, it was peaceful, there were talks, but in 1956, an armed ethnic conflict led by the Naga National Council was launched with the aim of forming an independent Nagaland. And, you know, we can spend time debating the ins and outs of an ethnic conflict, but the thing is, even though the people in states like Nagaland may, as we understand it, share the same ethnicity, they have tribal divisions of their own, and these hold a lot of weight. 
and as mainlanders we have little to no exposure to these tribes or their cultures so imagine being governed by people who have no idea about your history or culture and then try to make laws about the way you live uh so i think i need to pause here and just remind our listeners that outfit and struggles like these almost always um the result of grievances uh, that fall on deaf ears the northeast is a very good example of this in fact because it isn't a single state each state has its own reg- um, regional conflicts uh, and these conflicts are not just one thing it is they all have internal interstate and uh conflicts with the center and because central governments have famously not known what to do with the northeastern people policy has always tended to be biased then words like ungovernable get thrown around uh and once you uh, call a region ungovernable then you know historically we have tended to look at regions like this as a law and order problem instead of looking at policy gap so you know why else and in fact where else would conflicts mean sending armed forces to so called disturbed areas and then handing these armed forces special powers to operate as they see fit precisely so for anyone who has even remotely kept up with this tragic story you would have definitely heard of the armed forces special powers act 1958 or the afsp more so in terms of calls to repeat it but what the hell is afsp and why do we have even have it So a quick history lesson it was enacted by the parliament in 1958 the afspa was initially drawn up to support armed forces trying to maintain order in any part of the northeastern states of assam and manipur that were then designated as a disturbed area by the late 1980s the law was expanded to include all seven northeastern states and today even though three of them are no longer considered disturbed the afspa remains operational in four states including nagaland and FII a similar law is also in force in the disputed region of Jammu and Kashmir and basically what this act allows is that armed forces personnel above a certain rank can use force after due warning even to the causing of death it okays arrests including on the basis of reasonable suspicion and allows for officials to enter and search any premises both without warrants and the most contentious part of this act the afspa provides protection to any personnel acting under its purview stating that no persecution suit or other legal proceeding shall be instituted except with previous sanction of the central government so yeah it's pretty clear that it, this is a very poorly written act that thrives on ambiguity and according to most human rights defenders is in blatant violation of international human rights law so why do we have this law more than 63 years later after it was first instituted given that there are multiple records of excesses in 2017 for example the supreme court ordered for a special investigating team to look into an alleged 1528 extrajudicial killings by security forces in manipur between 2000 and 2012 the outcome of this sid probe is yet to be known back in 2005 another high level committee led by justice bp jivan reddy of the supreme court recommended that the act be repealed and like vagda pointed out The Naga State Cabinet has passed a resolution to formally ask the Union government to revoke it. Yet, as of now, it remains, and honestly, it looks like it will continue to remain in mm. the near future. Mm. Yeah. And here's the catch, okay? Don't get me wrong. I don't mean to pass off the excesses as mere collateral damage of bad policy, because that would be disrespectful to say the least. But the point is, the army, unlike say. I don't know the police forces isn't actually trained to handle internal conflicts like insurgency right. like that happened like say in the northeastern states but successive central governments have palmed off the conflict and have you know failed in changing their policy on internal conflict and have thus continued to deploy the army citing these areas to be or extraordinary or as the aspa labels them as disturbed areas and these men from the armed forces are then expected to suppress the sentiments that the locals hold that are often ex- like you know expressed through violence because honestly there are very few means for them to express their grievances hmm. and the bottom line is that this poorly thought out policy then continues to cost both civilian and defense lives over the decades and we just don't hold the right people accountable hmm so on that note we come to the end of our first segment we will be right back after a short break you're listening to press decode on the ivm podcasts network 
नमस्ते दिस इज साइरिस ब्रोचर आई एम पार्ट ऑफ द गवर्नमेंट कैंसल कल्चर प्रोग्राम टू रिमूव रबिश ऑफ ऑल द डिफरेंट स्ट्रीम अवेलेबल सो वॉट वी हैव इज ऑल द कलेक्टेड रबिश वी पुट टूगेदर ऑन आर शो इज कॉल साइरिस सेज इट्स ऑन आई वी एम पॉडकास्ट यू हैव टू वॉच इट एंड लिसन टू इट इट्स ऑन आर एप इट्स ऑन आर वेबसाइट इट्स ऑन द यूट्यूब चैनल इट्स ऑन फेसबुक दे मेनी डिफरेंट वेज डोट बॉदमी एंड आस्क मी हाउ यू हैव टू फाइंड आउट we talk to different personalities many of them are known some are just people we meet downstairs and invite them up for chai but the point is it's fun and it's very therapeutic so please join in and listen to cyrus ses hello and welcome back to press decode on the ivm podcasts network we're team splainer and make sure you follow us at splainer in on instagram and twitter to keep up with the splainer fam it's time for some food for thought so guys where do you stand on fitness Ah, uh, stupid question. It's like asking you where you guys stand on food, or you know where we stand on breathing. <laughs> oh, okay, I get the memo. Questions that we already know the answers to. So, guys, where do you stand on the government? <laughs> <laughs> no comment. Okay, so anyway, they're not the same thing, fitness and food. But it's still movement is pretty important for our bodies, right? But is movement the same thing as fitness, and is fitness the same thing as wellness? there are so many new terms in this industry that as an outsider i'm just like unable to understand what is going on so i am a very thin person for a new listener who doesn't know what i look like um i am a very thin person and i am at the receiving end of are beta kuch khaya karo at every family gathering and no amount of eating helps me gain weight so i joined a gym a few years ago and actually built some muscle and gained some weight which i lost over the next few years because i stopped going to the gym big surprise uh but the thing is that we're back to are beta aap kitne patle ho kuch khaya karo so because i am so thin to some i appear fit which i am not nearly because i barely move and also i need to fix but the other side is this whole cultural obsession with being fit mm. which i think i'd have totally given into if it wasn't just so damn hard it's so hard i actually found <laughs> research that helps me rationalize why it is so hard This sounds like a brilliant way to not do something, right? Like spend so much time and energy, energy to rationalize something that you know is not good. Yeah, but okay. So evolutionary psychology suggests that avoiding physical activity that is neither necessary nor rewarding is a fundamental and universal instinct among adults. And every culture has sometimes, you know, adults engaging in sports and dance and otherwise maybe movement for fun. But generally, humans. sit whenever possible according to research that monitored hunter gatherers in tanzania and elsewhere even those guys sit for 10 hours a day sit for 10 hours a day we're not talking about sleeping <laughs> you knew i i would have some stupid question like this no <laughs> i mean this it, it's still unbelievable i never imagined hunter gatherers would sit for 10 hours a day mm. it's unbelievable you know if you ask that is valid yeah yeah because from an evolutionary perspective this inertia to exercise makes sense because in the past f- when food was usually scarce energy spent on discretionary activities that diverted calories from your main aim which is taking care of yourself and making babies would be a stupid idea so don't feel bad if you struggle to exercise i mean you're not lazy you're normal and who even came up with the concept of like paying money to work out <laughs> oh my god really think about it what a wild idea why should i work so hard sweat like crazy lift weights for no purpose other than to lift them and also pay someone else for it jim bros vagda said it we didn't <laughs> dm vagda <laughs> it's vagda galotra <laughs> bring it bring it no but i know what you mean because personally i've done sports and other you know general physical activity for most of my life but the very thought of going to the gym is not something i've entertained unless i'm having a full blown crisis yeah yeah that's actually what got me there in the first place <laughs> yeah i can understand where the obsession for working out comes from but I don't think I will ever step foot in a gym. Not to say that this isn't new because we're such vain creatures. Uh but the pandemic has caused almost a paradigm shift in the way we see fitness and our bodies. I mean the pandemic is nearly 3 years old but we can't skip over the fact that it's been a stressful almost 3 years. Oh, we're going into the third year of the pandemic, no? Oh, we're going into the second year. We fin- <laughs> we'll finish second in March. 2019 December. No, no, I've been hearing that it is almost 3 years. Anyway listeners you can fact check and uh, dm me this time uh, but uh, yeah it was so, bad at math <laughs> so is sara but um, that's for another podcast 
two years and the, we're almost at the third wave. As you can see, the stress of all of it has gotten to me. I don't remember <laughs> when it started, <laughs> how many years it's been. So unlike me, a lot of people have taken to exercising to cope. Uh, cue all those gym bro reels about hashtag fighting my demons. But and a lot more people have actually fallen off the exercise wagon or they've put on weight and now want to, you know, desperately get rid of it. Whatever the reasons may be, this has created a very literal fitness boom during the pandemic. It has radically changed the way people work out. There's virtual workout groups and classes and boot camps and everyone and their mother either wants to join one or wants us to join their boot camps and classes. And I'll be honest, even after seeing it in real time, the numbers really surprised me. The home fitness equipment market was valued at about 1.2 trillion rupees last year. The annual growth rate between now and 2026 is a very impressive 2.75. But the most shocking number is um, the growth rate of the online fitness industry. The projected compound uh, annual growth is whopping 30.1% of what it is now. Oh my God. Okay. Somehow not surprised because so through the pandemic, I was first stuck in Bombay, then I went to, uh, stuck in Delhi and now I'm in Cochin. Anybody I have shared a house with was super into online fitness. Like I wasn't. But like, you know, they're like, and I'm just like, so I get it. People who never worked out were also doing it. Yeah, do you all remember, uh, you know, when we were supposedly supposed to get like a two week break, everybody was like, yeah, two weeks, I'm going to get shredded, floating abs. Uh, mm. God, yes. So, yeah, yeah, this is, it really did blow my mind that it's projected to be, you know, 30 0.1% of what it is now. Oh, some more fun facts for you guys. A business insider listicle from last year noted that in the panic buying haze Americans went through, uh, it uh, not only affected the supply of tissue paper and Clorox wipes, but also created a supply gap for dumbbells. Oh my God. Nobody could buy dumbbells online. Sounds valid. The gains must never stop. Oh, there's also entire resorts to getting people fitter and helping them shed their pandemic weight. And the crazy popular people are paying, again, they're paying money so that they can sweat sweat off their way. And it's copious amounts of money. Yeah, man. I don't understand. Like, who came up with this concept? <laughs> it's such a scam. Yeah, but, you know, the resorts also got me thinking. If people are this desperate, like, when I was stuck alone in the pandemic, I started having like a weird relationship with food and exercise. But I mean, are we too desperate to get fit? What is this fitness and gym culture now, you know, doing to our body image and mental health if everybody is going to nonsense like resorts to help them shed weight? <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, I mean... I'm the only non-sports kid, never have been. And this isn't a video pod. So for anyone listening, I'm fat, okay? And I've always been, really. And before anyone tells me, Aray, but you're cute. Nay, nay, you look good. Let me stop you right there. (laughs) Fat isn't a bad word. It's just a fact. And I am a-okay. I'm sure. I've had my moments of issues with my body. But for the most part, I'm more than comfortable. Anyway, the body positivity movement a couple of years ago was a welcome change in my life because I did find a moment to go well yay I'm gonna celebrate my body etc etc we've all heard of it but the flip side of this which I am very acutely aware of much like (laughs) Vanta is that I'm like very very unfit so it's been interesting to see this weird 2021 amalgamation of the body positivity and like the weight loss movements I could never put a finger on it and like you know what made me uncomfortable but recently, we carried this, this piece in our Goodread section that looked at this app called Noom in the US that essentially used psychology to, I quote, build new habits to crush your goals. And it all finally made sense. It's actually the most fascinating take on weight loss. It isn't about your ideal body types or, I don't know, your size zero figures. Instead, the emphasis is on this idea of wellness over weight loss. It basically rides on this new influenza insta wave of body positivity while talking about a more holistic way of shedding the pounds. So I think your resorts, you know, would fit mm. right in because it's a lifestyle change, you say. We, all these terms are just like flying over my head right now. Precisely. That's the point. Mm. But eventually it all boils down to the same thing, cutting down on food consumption, much like any other diet fad ever has Mm. and that's exactly the thing right it's easier to shut off blatant body shaming but when packaged like this 
it does seem way more enticing. And that's the catch. Uh, someone who was talking about Noom in the same article, they put it this way. The way they market and the way Noom works is incredibly dangerous and harmful for anyone trying to have a relationship with food and their body. And I think even as I share a complicated relationship with body positivity, I'm not sold on the idea. It seems mm-hmm. like two extremes right now. Either you have all these wellness brands co-opt the idea Or you have influencers who sometimes go ahead and encourage straight up unhealthy lifestyle choices under the garb of body positivity. And honestly, it was as recently as I was reading for this episode that I read about something called body neutrality, which essentially seeks that you accept your body, allow it to be, focus on what makes it possible for you to do and feel rather than how it looks. So it isn't, hey, let's celebrate. It is, hey, this is what it is. If I can feel fitter, great. And I guess at least... I, for one, am going to be looking at like adopting that instead. Same, same. I mean, at this, it's wedding season and all I get to hear is either please eat something or please get married. I mean, at this point. God. So I'm just going to make a list of all the creative answers I can retort with and let me see what I can come up with in terms of body neutrality. (laughs) And on that note, we come to the end of this segment. We will be right back after a short break. You're listening to Press Decode on the IBM Podcasts Network. Hey everybody, it's been another great week on the IVM Podcast Network. On Cyrus Says, Cyrus is joined by filmmaker and screenwriter Lena Yadav. She is the creator behind the acclaimed true crime Netflix series, House of Secrets, The Burari Deaths. It's a great episode, do check it out. On The Habit Coach, Ashton is joined by Lakshmi Tasaka, co-founder of Slay Coffee. They share a pretty interesting theory about coffee and share four ways to inculcate the coffee habit into your lives. We have Sudesh Gautam with us on Audio Gyan. Kedar talks to Sudesh about his aesthetics and the kinds of colors he uses in his artworks. On non Gadi, Sadaf and Archit explore the world of Besan, which can be cooked in both sweet and savory forms. And the Legend of the Month episode on The Fighting Goat is back. Arjun and Somesh talk about UFC's longest reigning champion, Anderson Silva. Do follow us on social media. We're IVM Podcast on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And remember, if you're enjoying this show or any of our other shows for that matter, please do tell a friend. And finally, do remember that many of our shows are available on YouTube. You can check that out by going to our website, ivmpodcast.com slash YouTube, where we have a list of all of our various YouTube channels. Finally, we'd like to thank the sponsors on the network this week, Cred, Bank of Baroda, HDFC Mutual Fund, CoinSwitch, Kuber, Intel, and Oxfam India. Thank you so much for making this possible. Welcome back to Press Decode on the IBM Podcasts Network. It's time for our final segment this week, Roast or Toast. Prafula, do the honors, please. So I'm back on the grumpy side today, guys. I mean, I will say this. I did go back and forth on this item because it is so funny. But, you know, I've built a brand. It's a budding brand with our listeners. So, you know, obviously branding one out. Uh, There's this (laughs) online journal called um, the Journal of Universal Rejections that aims to ring out And this is a direct quote, ring out any happiness that academics might feel by rejecting every single submission that it gets. And it doesn't care for the quality of your paper either. On one hand, it is so delightful to me, the very concept. On the other, a piece of my soul would absolutely wither and die if my computer told me, oh, your writing is shitty. I will not accept this. (laughs) (laughs) My fave item, um, it's from Splainer's Monday edition that had one key study of note. An international survey found Australia is the drunkest country in the world. And what's the measure? The point of drunkenness, my dears. (laughs) Aussies get to the point of drunkenness at least 27 times a year, which is way more than the global average of 15. Okay, be right back applying for Australian visa. Uh, they really know how to party, huh? Mm-hmm. I was going to say that, but my parents listen, so I don't know what the point of drunkenness <laughs> even means. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, okay. So this week, I found out about China's most popular meme. It's the phrase tanking, which means lying flat. It isn't a patriotic slogan if you were missled. And President Z doesn't like it one bit. The phrase instead captures the longing of young Chinese to opt out of the relentless drive to succeed, not overworking, being content with more attainable achievements and allowing time to unwind. It is basically all about the longing of exhausted young Chinese to quit the rat race. And can I just say, what a whole ass mood, man. Like, yes, (laughs) I truly believe lying flat and simply existing 
will do me so much good like not a care in my mind and all of that yeah man reminds me of the first few weeks of the lockdown you know i was so happy like the whole world had like slowed down suddenly there was no rat race happening everyone had slowed down and i was feeling good like and i was feeling guilty about feeling good because you could do nothing in those 3 weeks i mean there was a race of like competitiveness and like all of these things that you had to do in those 3 weeks but i actually like really enjoyed it also to call back wagda's point humans are made to sit yes you heard it here first y'all it's science now okay so that was our show this week thank you so much for joining us on press d code you can catch us every thursday on the ivm podcasts network and guys please remember don't let the news give you the blues Eventually you'll see the end of your childhood get accustomed to womanhood enjoy the experience of sisterhood might get to wifehood or not choose motherhood or not you learn to define your personhood earn a livelihood change the neighborhood and get rid of the falsehood that life post academia is easy so join me ritasha and me ayushi on a journey from station starting point to station um what now next station Pudding station and hopefully Agla station, adulthood. Fresh episodes out every Thursday. Remember the days when our granny used to narrate once upon a time stories. Let's bring back the good old days of moral stories with Story Time Tamil. Hi, I am Ravi Shankar Balachandran, host of Story Time Tamil podcast. I would like you to entertain and educate your children. with stories from story time tamil tune in to the new episode sharp at 7 pm every day on ivm website ivm podcast app youtube channel or wherever you get your podcast from